The more I think about Azula in the Spirit Temple, the more it interests me. I was rather afraid that it would be a simple, rather banal redemption narrative that undercuts the psychological complexity of Azula's character. Her pride, her absolute confidence in herself, her desperate attempt to maintain control over people. Her rather bleak worldview that emphasizes power and authority as the heart of all relationships. These are inevitably part of Azula's character. They don't stop her from being charming and rather sympathetic and even poignant as the beach above all episodes showcases quite well, but they are parts of her character. I was slightly disappointed by the Kuvira narrative that they crafted, Ruins of the Empire, because I thought it was a little too tidy and a little too narrowly configured to give Kuvira a pat semi-redemption instead of delving into the full ambiguity of her character. That is not the problem with Azula and the Spirit Temple, a book I quite find fascinating. I'm not sure I entirely like all of it, but it's daring, it's imaginative, it's dreamlike and weird and inventive in a way that Avatar at its best is. And I do believe it's divisive to an extent. It fundamentally features Azula attempting and failing to come to some sort of peace. She does attain a level of understanding, as I discussed in an earlier video, but she does this against her will, and it's a level of understanding she does not really want to admit. Azula, to provide a little plot summary, is working with a group of associates that she freed from a restrictive institution, the same one she escaped from, and her fellow comrades want to go back and create a mission to rescue a captured person that they deeply care for. Azula views this mission fundamentally as a distraction and attempts to control them through force. They ultimately abandon her and complete the rescue mission, and Azula is alone again. Azula is very hauntingly alone, and that is what I think this graphic novel emphasizes above any other ideas or themes, and does so very well and very astutely. She does not have anyone who will support her, and she knows that the idea that people will support her is just an illusion. She knows that she has created this rift between herself and others, but she does not want to fully admit it. The bulk of the narrative is a good example of what in the TV world is always called a bottle episode. Small scale, disconnected a bit from the rest of the story, and it's simply focused on one character and her psychological and 
and emotional complexities and the tensions and conflicts that she is attempting to endure and how those conflicts fundamentally test the beliefs and value systems she holds. I find it fascinating in large part because of how astutely it subverts a lot of these dream narratives that we're accustomed to getting. In the typical narrative, say WandaVision or Mabel's Bubble and Gravity Falls or a million other things, a character is presented with this entrancing dream world that they ultimately have to reject and return to reality. The dream is too good to be true and the character must realize this. This is a very old trope. It's a very old technique. I was recently reading uh, Lucan's Civil War and there's this harrowing, deeply heartbreaking point of the book right before the final confrontation between Pompey and Caesar where Pompey aging has a dream of earlier days when he was famed and beloved and the world of pomp and splendor and spectacle in Rome but that world is far gone and he clings to it, but he ultimately must accept that it's not coming back. That is how these kinds of narratives normally go. But Azul in the Spirit Temple twists this basic format a bit. The problem is not that Azula clings to these fantasies and has trouble rejecting them. The problem is almost that she rejects them too easily. There is this telling and incisive moment early when Azula thinks back in her dream to her childhood. And yes, you could say it is a bit sad that she thinks of her childhood as a separate far distant stage of her life considering how young she still is. But such is unfortunately the case. She thinks of her childhood as a formative time now, a time where things perhaps could have gone differently, but she rejects easy comforts. She burns a turtle duck, little figurine, it seems, with her fire bending, and her mother sees her, notes that she's fire bending and that she has caused this damage, and her mother is quite concerned. Ozai, conversely, celebrates her. He calls her a prodigy. He pushes. Ursa subtly but coercively to give Azula praise and she simply says enigmatically that Azula is very much her father's daughter. Azula then has a second version of the dream where she gets unequivocal praise from her mom what she says that she wants. And yet, she knows this isn't true. She rejects it. Da, 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 this is a vision given to her by the spirit that gives her this place of shelter. The spirit is an enigmatic figure. He's an ambiguous figure. The spirit does not seem to have any mal intentions. There is every reason to believe that what the spirit says is genuine. That the 
little rest house the spirit provides, this spirit temple, is a place of crossroads, a place where healing and acceptance and forgiveness are possible, but violence and cruelty in a nightmarish world are also possible. Whichever it is depends on what the person wants. If Azula had genuinely wanted this sweet, caring acceptance, then she would have received it. But Azula does not want this. She knows it's not real. She constantly rejects it for not being real, and she does not believe in the fantasy. We see this again with her scene when Azula pictures herself praised by all the members of her family. There is a part of her who wants this, but not entirely. She says that she wants everyone to apologize to her, to ask for her forgiveness. But ultimately, she knows on a deeper level that this is not the case, that this is not and cannot be real. The nightmarish turns the narrative takes in its last third are nothing more, nothing less, the spirit implies, than the manifestations of Azula's own mind. Azula might say that she wants others to completely lower themselves before her and applaud her for everything she does, but she fundamentally knows that this is a false vision, that it is not and cannot be real. She, in a way, wants a kind of punishment. Or at least she feels that she deserves it, whatever she says. I think of Freud, who fundamentally, in regards to dreams especially, makes a distinction between the overt or apparent quality of the dream and its latent or true quality. Dreams are especially important for Freud not because they are completely separate from the ordinary method that the psyche uses to comprehend its overall environment, but because it's not. The uh, superficial obvious layer and then the latent layer are there in ordinary life, in our waking reality, but they're separate. In dreams, they, they blur. and the unconscious becomes more visible. Azula is not entirely wrong, and she is not 100% at fault. The fact that she picks a time very early in her life when her father celebrated her is important, not just or how that contrasts with her mother's disapproval, but because she understands that her father constantly praising her, constantly rewarding her ability for battle and violence led her down this dark path. A lot of Azula apologists say that she is 100% formed by this admittedly vile environment she grows up in. But that's a bit too simplistic, and thankfully the comic does not take that vulgarly sociological approach. Azula was set up to fail, and she was set up to suffer 
and be beholden to her worst and most destructive impulses. But nonetheless, she still has active and free choice. Herself is not encased in stone. It was not made for her. She has the chance and the capacity to change for the better, to fundamentally break free of those corrosive influences and shape her own fate. And yet she suffers from this deep sense of self-loathing. She feels that the world is against her, and she also feels, though she does not overtly admit it, that they are right to be against her. All the very grim and dour words that May and Tai Lee say to her are ultimately creations of her own mind. They are what she believes they would say to her. She feels this rift between herself and those around her so absolute that she cannot accept those kind words. She cannot accept even any gestures of forgiveness. The spirit makes this explicit. She does not ask for forgiveness, but also others try to give her that forgiveness, especially early in the work. They try to treat her with kindness and respect in the fluffy, calm stages of her dream world experience, and she ultimately rejects these kind words as being fundamentally false. She does not really want what she says she wants, which is for everyone to bow before her and completely say that they were completely at fault and that they should have praised her unequivocally. She knows that's not true, but she also feels herself desperately alone and desperately unable to connect with others. The graphic novel highlights this Freudian discrepancy quite lucidly. And the result is harrowing. A lot occurs in this work, and it's perhaps a bit too much. It's all these little corners and sparks of her psyche that she does not quite understand how to comprehend or how to make into a coherent whole. All she can do for now is be alone. And the graphic novel acknowledges the poignancy of such a fate, while also acknowledging that she does not really have any better options right now. Her psyche is still that troubled. She's not doomed, but there are no easy paths forward for her. So thank you all for watching. If you liked this on the day, don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe. Go into my Patreon if you can, or do you want to see more videos like this before anyone else. Write off in the comments about how you viewed Azula's story in this narrative. Do you think it's too kind to her? Too harsh to her? I'm interested. Adios, comrades.